as you notice, we're, we're not in Romans 11, as I originally thought. And unless you've been living under a rock, I love saying that, you know, as if anyone lives under a rock, but, or a lead mine, you know that there have been some crazy things happening recently. Former presidential candidate Ted Cruz remarking on a law that was passed not only not in our country, but not even on our continent. He wrote this and said, this Uganda law is horrific and wrong. Any law criminalizing homosexuality or imposing the death penalty for, quote, aggravated homosexuality is grotesque and an abomination. And this is in capital letters, all civilized nations to join together in condemning this human rights abuse. Oh, I thought Ted Cruz was, no, I guess not. So my immediate response on Twitter was, Ted, homosexuality itself is an abomination. What standard are you using anyway? Well, Tom Askell is a little older than I am and he's wiser than I am. And he said, tell it to God, Ted. And he quotes Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And he asked, was this law God gave to his old covenant people horrific and wrong? By what standard? The president of Uganda, Yuwari Museveni, said this, Europe is lost. So they also want us to be lost. And then speaking to the legislature of Uganda, he said, it is good that you rejected the pressure from imperialists. I mean, think of the language. Imperialism, imposing your will upon another people. It is good that you rejected the pressure of the imperialists. And this is what I told them. Whenever they come to me, I say, you please shut up. <laughs> Now, of course, people can't resist chiming in on this. Russell Moore wrote a piece for something today. I don't want to call it Christianity today because whatever they are today isn't Christianity anymore. But he wrote, this is why I think the Uganda anti-homosexuality law is morally wrong and opposed to the way of Jesus. I, can't, I still can't figure out if he's Trinitarian or not because, you know, Jesus and God are... Yeah. And here's the thing, homosexuality is criminalized in more than 30 of Africa's 54 countries. Can you, can you guess what religious motivation is behind some of those countries? Well, right, it's Islam. Most Africans see it as a behavior imported from abroad and not innate. And by the way, all 50 states of the U.S. Had laws against this, and just beginning in my short lifetime, in 1961 in Illinois, they've been repudiated and overturned. I have to take a second here to make a little observation. Don't you find it interesting that for the woke crowd, this thing going on in Africa is a double-edged sword? Well, yeah, we're opposed to these horrible and barbaric laws, but there are African people doing what we would call uh, self-rule. So where, where do we fall? You know, like Phil Silvers just give up. But. So we're going to talk about this. It, as, as Kevin mentioned, this is Pride Month. Pride is at the pinnacle of the, of the, of the sins. And most uh, old theologians would have said pride is what caused the fall. In the first place, it's been pride all along. Why do you think they chose Pride. Why do you think they co-opted the, the rainbow? God's promise. I'm not going to flood you. Well, they took that and said, yeah, this will be our symbol. I got bad news for them. The next judgment won't be water, but anyway. So first of all, Proverbs 16, 18 from the King James. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We just heard from Matthew 19, when Jesus is addressing the issue of divorce, there's a baseline, fundamental, constituent component of his entire argument. What is it? 
Haven't you read that from the beginning man was created as male and female, that God created him this way. At the time that Jesus was teaching from Matthew 19, at that time, there were two opposing opinions that were held by Orthodox Jews. One was Hillel and one was Shammai, the heads of the antagonistic schools of Jewish tradition. The school of Hillel contended that a man might divorce his wife for almost any reason, including burning their kosher meal. That would have been a legitimate reason. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. The school of Shammai was a little more strict and permitted divorce only in the case of fornication, adultery, or some offense against chastity. So in the context of Jesus refuting this traditionalism that had grown up in the Pharisee school, they were trying to trip him up and their hard-heartedness he demonstrates things that are baked in to the discussion. Don't let anyone tell you Jesus never talked about this subject. First of all, whatever the Pharisees were writing in the Old Testament is true truth. Have you not read? So the incarnate Son of God, have you not read what God spoke? There's another passage in Matthew where those are the exact words. The Bible is what God has spoken. Genesis 1, creation from the very beginning. So number one, Jesus goes right back to the first part of the scripture. Genesis 1, 1, God created and God made people in his image and God made them male and female. And number two, that brings us to the second baseline is that God's design is only male and female. That necessarily excludes any consideration whatsoever of male and male, or female and female, or even male and females in the plural, or even vice versa, it's always and only two. Remember, God, God would grant these concessions because of hardness of heart, and no one's gonna make the case for hardness of heart being the normative thing for the Christian either. And then finally, only in an exclusively male and female relationship can it be considered to be a one flesh union? Anything else, anything else is outside of those creational and covenant norms that God established. And as we, as we heard last week, biblical marriage is intended by God to be a great blessing, to bring joy, to bring benefit, and to benefit everyone, including people that aren't married yet. It's supposed to be a well-tilled garden. I know, sometimes we're bad weed pullers and tillers, but this is God's design. This is our goal, right? And see, in the, in the Twitter thread that got Tom Askell, I couldn't believe how many people were trolling him, by the way. He has a more visibility. I have some trolls, but I just keep them under the bridge. His are up right here. And as he wrote in his thread, it wasn't about the desire to impose the death penalty. It's about what standard is, is Ted Cruz using? What standard does anyone use to say that crime is an abomination or that, that law is an abomination? You just flip the script. The Bible says homosexuality is an abomination. You say a law against it is an abomination. Who am I going to go with, right? In our New Testament Bible, there's a passage that sometimes is overlooked. It's Hebrews 2.2. 2. And in Hebrews 2.2, 2, it said, For if the message spoken by angels was binding, speaking of the law, and every violation and disobedience received its what punishment? Anyone? Just. Just punishment. I got, I got trolled four years ago for saying the same thing. A guy put a video up with the clip and then the picture had me behind the fires of hell and a big red circle through hate preacher wants death penalty for gays. It was the same exact thing that Tom Askell went through. That's not the point at all. The point is to say that what God commanded his old covenant people to do to those who were going to bring this kind of threat into the people 
was just. That's New Testament. That's apostolic. Don't let anyone tell you that all these strictures are back there way back then. No, according to the author of Hebrews, those were, that was justice. And before we go all shocked, we're so culturally sensitive, come on. What, let's use the words God uses, okay? This is the New Covenant Scripture stating explicitly what I just said. In Leviticus 18, we just heard this, the land has become defiled. How was the land of Canaan defiled? By the sexual sins that are listed through Leviticus chapter 18. I would invite you to read that this afternoon if you want a um, shocking lesson in how not to live in the land. <laughs> It actually says that the, the land has vomited out its inhabitants. It's so bad. Now we're, we're coming up to, you know, next, next Lord's Day, we'll go back into Romans. But when we started Romans, it was Romans 1. There's that old Abbott and Costello sketch, first base, you know, third base. I don't know, third base. Well, this is Romans 1. Everything, because well, that's Romans 1. That sounds like Romans 1. Somebody said, wow, so far it looks like we're, we're seeing Romans 1 being played out. I'm like, yeah, exactly. But Paul's point in Romans 1 is to point out the twisted nature of idolatry and what it leads to. And if you exchange the glory and knowledge of God whom you know exists, everyone knows there's God, and you're, as Romans 1.20 says, you're without excuse. What's going to happen? Your thinking and your behavior are going to be affected drastically. I mean, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's what we think we do. We conceive and we execute. Romans 1.26, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. What kind of passions? Well, it goes on. See, even their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire for one another. Listen to the language. And, and, and if someone has the King James, you'll see these, like the word vile is used. It's particularly obnoxious desires that, that they have for each other. And here in Romans 1, Homosexuality is a highly and particularly conspicuous example of the deliberate suppression of the truth of the knowledge of God and how he made us. Paul is saying, this is bad. Another New Testament passage, well known. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul doesn't leave the word unrighteous in the abstract. He tells us exactly what he's talking about. And he says, look, church, Corinth, don't be deceived. Don't, don't let someone lie to you and walk around believing a lie. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He's very specific. And we just read in that list, the effeminate and the homosexuals. There's another passage in the New Testament that we've taught through here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10, realizing the fact that the law was not made for the righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers. Talk about your fifth commandment violation murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, what else, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. And we'll come back to 1 Corinthians 6 towards the end, but I just want to make this note here. In these passages, Paul uses a term that many scholars believe that he coined, like kind of like Shakespeare invented a bunch of our English language. Paul here comes up with a, a, a word that literally means man better. A man who sleeps with a man. It's called arsenokoites. And by the use of this term, he makes it absolutely certain of what he's referring to. There's a film coming out, the 1946 project, where they 
try to say that the term was invented, homosexual, just made up out of whole cloth. Look, a rose by any other name would smell as sour. Uh, just because you have a term that describes some other thing doesn't mean that the thing itself didn't exist. That's the point. <clears throat> and here's the question we ask, and, and we all know this, but a rhetorical question, does not God have the right as creator to determine what kind of sexual behavior is appropriate for his creatures and what glorifies him? Of course he does. Of course he does. And it takes place within that covenant fireplace. You know, I always use the, you can have a fire and it burns up the house or you can keep it in the wood stove and it gives warmth and joy to everyone around them, right? That's God's plan. So what's at the root of all this? Well, again, it's, it's pride and idolatry. I will not serve this God. I will serve the God in the mirror. All the blessings that God gives us in creation, his you know, good food, friends, family, wives, husbands, children, pleasant dwellings, a spouse to love and be loved by, even, even sex itself. These are all meant to point us in gratitude to God, not to turn it inward. They were never intended to be terminating on the thing itself. And what does fallen man do with God's mercy? He holds it down and suppresses it. So we know what the Bible says about this. There's just no question at all. So first of all, I want to deal with three fallacies and then three facts. The first fallacy is probably found in most popular TV and song. It's I was born this way. That's my excuse. We've all heard it. I can't deny who I really am. Well, that's now, we've given that its full head. Now we don't know what bathrooms to use or what beer to not drink. <laughs> It rhymes with Ludbite, uh, you know, something like that. But it's a, it's a purely presupposed and undocumented view. It's, it's everywhere. And the first line of defense, here's the thing. Things have changed since, since I began looking into this. Back in the mid-90s, I reviewed a book for a magazine, and it became, okay, I'm going to study this further. And back then, everyone's looking for the gay gene. The, the thing that makes up the genetic comp component. Because remember, these people are naturalists. They don't believe in creator God, but they're looking for something. Well, that's all old hat now, because guess what? If it's genetic, you can fix it. <laughs> but I don't think they want to be, quote, fixed. And that was an elusive dream, and guess what? It didn't exist. It never existed. And so when the science couldn't come up, keep up with the rhetoric, this category was invented in what we would call pseudoscience. In other words, it can't be tested and repeated and observed in the laboratory, so it's not actual science. It's the behavioral sciences. Sometimes, yes, sociology can give us some insights. But this brand new category was invented. It was called orientation. And it just bolsters the born this way, only you don't have to prove it with genetics. All you got to do is prove it by what you think. As if this was an inborn psychological trait, although I can't see how that is practically all that different. It's still innate to their thinking. Now listen, there's a, there is a grain of truth to the born this way. Because we were all born in who? Adam. Our Papa Adam fell. And as the confessions say, he thrust all his progeny into, into darkness and death and sin. Everyone is born sinful. We've all inherited Adam's guilt. That's Romans 5.12. Everyone barks, bears the mark of this, this kind of twisted creation in one way or another. The fall was the wrench in the works, as, as Schaefer used to say. Some people are born with a physical handicap, some with mental issues, and some have this kind of twistedness thrust upon them in early childhood. But if you want to test the hypothesis, just trade out anything for the topic we're talking about. If anyone were to come to you and say, I love overeating and getting drunk, 
and I have a horrible temper and I just want to sleep with every woman I see and God made me this way. This is my orientation. Well, we would say you're crazy. Wait a minute. We used to say that was crazy. Now we don't so much, right? Things have changed pretty quickly. But we would all agree. What, what's at the base of that? They're blaming God for their problems. As the old Christian rock band used to sing, blood good, don't blame God for your own self-destruction. People do this all the time. That the, the, the singer from whatever that band that was popular, he's saying, well, it must be God's decree that I am like this. And I'm like, you want to be like you. That's, what, that's the problem. And all you got to do is substitute the word temptation for orientation, and you're on the right track again. Now you're back using God's words, and now you can apply God's solution. What's God's solution for temptation? Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. The blood of the Lord Jesus, which, which forgives of all sins. Now we're back in the Bible, but if you stick with orientation, there's nothing you can do. And that's bad. There's another fallacy, and I'll, I'll run through this one a little more quickly, that the, the prohibition against all activity like this is not the same as a loving monogamous. It's just a historical fallacy, though. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, again, I'm not going to get far into the weeds of whether this is even possible given Matthew 19 and Christ's emphasis. Paul knew all about rare monogamous relationships. And despite the attempts to paint pagan history as some kind of gay paradise, which they try to do. In fact, there's a historian I follow on YouTube who basically exposed all of that as just nonsense and made up out of like a picture on one urn somewhere and they developed this whole thing. Kind of like Colonial Williamsburg has a violin maker shop based entirely on the fact that there is a one ad for a violin in one newspaper one time in Williamsburg. There's no evidence there was ever, ever. It's the same principle, though. We find a picture that may look like something on an urn, and we develop a whole thing. Guess what? He, he got demonetized when he did this. The guy's from, like, Eastern Europe. I thought, I thought it was crazy, but no. No, Paul's talking about, and the Bible's talking about the thing itself. What about the, the fallacy that Jesus never said anything? Well, again, how Trinitarian are we? Yahweh has spoken. God is, God is not to be divided into mean God of the Old Testament and the nice version in the New where it's all love and acceptance. That's nonsense. In fact, I would make the case that you thought that Yahweh was full of wrath. Wait till you... What does the son say? Bring these rebels in front of me and have them killed. I mean, Jesus is not, he's not like the kinder, gentler Yahweh. Jesus is the fully God, fully man, took the sins of his people upon himself in the most gruesome fashion. So any, anytime anyone says that, you can tell they're not, they're not tracking at all. Jesus is the same God that wrote the Old Testament. And there's a bonus Fallacy. I just, I came up with this this morning. I was working on it. What about the revoice fallacy? Have you heard of this one? And this is the one that's gaining more popularity in our, in our own circles. Presbyterian Church, America, Southern Baptist. Basically says it's okay to identify with your temptation as long as you never act on it. Now listen, what did Jesus say about adultery? The same principle applies. Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you, what? Lust. Jesus put the onus on the desires of the heart, not the outward action alone. So that's, I think the whole revoice thing is merely Phariseeism 101. It's washing the outside of the cup, as long as you don't act on it, no. And this is harmful to anyone who's really struggling. All right, those are four fallacies, not just three. What do we conclude, though? What are, what are three facts? Obviously, we're not going to touch on all of everything this morning. First of all, here's something we, we cannot do. We dare not attempt to equalize all sins. 
It is true on one level, in one sense, that any sin, including sexual sin, can get you excluded from the kingdom. In that specific sense, yeah, all sins are equal, all sins condemn. Yet none of this means that the church should regard all sins, let alone all sexual sins, as basically the same in God's eyes and that God views them all exactly the same. Remember, there are degrees of punishment. Jesus said specifically that for some people, there's going to be a greater degree of punishment. And here's the thing. If, if a man desires someone other than his wife or a woman desires other than her husband, that is sin. And we can say that that is an abuse of a God-sanctioned design. However, if a man lusts after another man, it's not an abuse of a good thing. It's fundamentally overthrowing everything God has ever said about sex. It's, it's a perversion of God's sanctioned sexuality. And so much so that it, it's never pointed to as a one flesh union. It violates Jesus' definition. That's the template by which all human relationships are judged. Always, always defined by the Bible as something of great abhorrence to God. It's called an abomination. It's detestable. And remember, it's the sin that Paul uses in Romans 1 to exemplify the twistedness of exchanging the truth of God for a lie and worshiping something other than God. It's a violation of God, how God made everyone. It's not that complicated. Tim, Tim Bailey said this at a pastor's conference. I'll say it again. If you really want to know what you are, just look in the mirror. It's right there. It's all, it's all in front of you. That's all I'll say. God made you a man or he made you a woman. Now, that said, this is not ultimately the worst sin. It's not. The worst sin is breaking the greatest commandment. That is not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Homosexuality, though, is a byproduct of the worst sin. If this sin is left unrepentant, it will destroy not only that person, but the people around them. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, this is after that list that Paul gives, by the way, he says, flee sexual immorality. And then he goes on and he gets very pointed. He says, every other sin a person commits is outside his body, but the sexually immoral sin sins, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Folks, make no mistake, sexual sin is pernicious. It's tangled. It gets its claws in, into you in a way that other sins don't. And nobody said that being faithful and living a life of repentance was easy. But we dare not say that living a life of faithful repentance is impossible. We dare not say that. So even though it's not the worst one, it's tough. It's very tough. And number three, let's bring it back to 1 Corinthians 6. He said, don't be deceived. The unrighteous don't inherit the kingdom. And then we get the list, including homosexuality, including idolatry. And then he says at the end of, of, of verse, no, it's, it's in verse 11. He goes, and such were some of you. So he's talking to a church. Corinth, we know, is a very, like a sailor town, all the vices of sailors. And he goes, this is what you were. This is your past tense. It's not your identity. I mean, no Corinthian would walk around saying, I'm one of those adulterous Christians. I'm one of the drunken Christians, let alone homosexual Christians. He goes, this is your past such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. The wonderful, glorious point that he makes is this, such were some of you. 
You used to be one way. You used to be on your way to an eternity separate from God, but now you're this. Now you're this. We must hold out hope for anyone who's seeking to be free from their own inner conflicts and struggles that sometimes come on the outside. <clears throat> Take a second right now and look around you. There's a bunch of blessing in our company this morning. Why? Because people are being faithful to God and they're getting married and they're having children and yeah, every, every time, every Lord's Day, we have more and more kids and Heidi leans over and goes, the natives are restless. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and, and the natives are next generation Christians, so there we go, you know. That's a good thing. And this is, this is a beautiful picture, though. These are, y'all are examples of the beauty of natural human relationship as, as bounded by God's covenant design. Marriage, family, stability. We know the stats on fatherlessness. You want to see him drive to Chicago this afternoon? Well, don't. I don't. There's children, grandchildren. Everyone benefits, including pagans. Pagans benefit when Christians are stable. Society benefits. And God ordains that the basic building block of all society consists of a dad, a mom, and what just usually naturally follows as they covenant together and grow. This is just following what, what Paul called the natural function. It's baked in, but guess what? We in America have abandoned this. We in America are facing the inevitable consequences of our rebellion. You wanna know what the state religion is? Just look at the federal buildings when the sun sets this month. Department of Agriculture, the Department of Education, the State Department, the Department of Treasury, all gloriously clothed in the color of the rainbow. I don't get it. You guys, you guys actually think that not being judged by water is a good thing? Well, we know that's not what they mean. The pressure that our own government puts on foreign powers to adopt our global homo way of thinking is abysmally bad. This is why the president of Uganda says, please shut up. We don't need your, but did you see the university students protesting, saying, we don't want Biden or your money. Go, go to the nether regions. It was glorious. Go Uganda. Our friend Joel Webbin says, someday we might turn on the TV and we'll see an advertisement. Just think, for, just, for a mere 10 cents a day, you can feed one of these starving American kids. Listen, now, let me, let me close with this. Obviously, we don't exhibit this kind of pride. We can't. We also can't be like the Pharisee who goes around saying, I thank God I'm not proud like this tax collector or this homosexual, right? Pride goes before destruction. It's a, it's a bad situation when this is being celebrated and you're being pressured to join in the celebration. Guys, God's ways are good. They bring blessing, they bring life. The natives are restless, there's life. This is a good thing. And our attitude can be anything other than arrogance and pride. What did you do to gain God's favor? Huh? Zip, but he do don nothing. We can do nothing. And, and if we bring something in our hands to God and say, well, this is good. Maybe you should honor me for this. You don't understand the gospel. Folks, you're going to be under a lot more pressure, not just this month, but the next few years. I'm encouraged on a number of fronts. Um, I'm encouraged that a younger generation is 
refusing the old boomer con mentality, even in the church. I'm encouraged by seeing the next generation of Christian leaders rise to the occasion. I think we've got a couple of them coming to our conference this fall, Lord willing. But at the same time, this is a fight. These people hate you and they hate the God that you worship. So keep being a radical. As Schaefer said, we're not to be conservatives. We're to be the radicals because Jesus calls us to a radical, real discipleship life, which means we have to go against the spirit of the age. But the good news is God has all the authority and God has all the power. And God promises that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against God's church. Are you the church this morning? Right? God's on our side. Not politically, not ideologically, but from his word, he says, I will protect my people. So be encouraged. We live in clown world. If, if, if the prophet Isaiah, I am a clown and I, met, I live amidst clown world, but by the grace of God, right? All right, let's close with that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mercy towards us. We thank you for the fact that we have been rescued from the clutches of the enemy, from the slavery of sin and death. And but by your grace, Lord, we would be as arrogant and, and proud as the next man. Please help us to remember your, your love for us, your concern for your people and your power over even the wicked rulers of this age. Give us courage and boldness. We ask all this for your glory. In the name of Christ, amen.